Welcome to Celebrating Act 2. Celebrating Act 2 is the user manual for the second half of your life. Welcome to Celebrating Act 2 with John Coleman and I and our special guest, John Mariani, the virtual gourmet. How you doing, John Mariani? I'm very well. We've had a glorious July of not so hot weather here in New York. It's been wonderful. Mm. Oh, we've had beautiful weather here in Southern California. Right. Hey, John, uh, speaking of uh, July, this is uh, an interesting time for travel. Um, because the airlines are, are having problems. Of course, we've got inflation. We've got lots of stuff going on. But the airlines are having uh, not enough people. Uh, plus, we've still got uh, residual COVID uh, requirements in different countries. And, 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 you know, they're canceling flights left and right. Prices have doubled since February, because the last time I flew was in June. Um, and it was twice as much as it cost twice as much across the country as it did for me in February. What's going on with the airlines now? Give us an update. Well, as usual, the airlines are finding ways to inconvenience everybody as much as they possibly can <laughs> still, and still make record profits. Um, this is the American way, unfortunately, but um, I'm going to wax nostalgic in a few minutes, but to set, set the stage, uh, we have a perfect storm of supply and demand. There is an enormous demand post-COVID for people to get out there and get back to families and Fourth of July and Thanksgiving and all of that. Um, Europe has opened up, so all those people who are dying to get to Paris and Rome want to do that. So um, the demand is strong, which says something about the economy, except that the supply is very limited for reasons that the airlines well know. During COVID, uh, quite legitimately, air travel went down. <laughs> so much down that you couldn't fly on any plane uh, for a period of time. So what do they do in their wisdom? They canned or, 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 or paid off uh, pilots to retire, never thinking that COVID would someday end, never think that there would be a rebound. So they are now left with um, a, a, a airline without enough pilots uh, through their own doing. And to train a pilot is a very long, long process. To train uh, flight attendants is a very long, long process. And they just ain't got them. So everything is backed up in that respect. And then when you get to the airports uh, themselves, um, because of security lines, which uh, are a horrendous invention uh, uh, caused by certain, certain things that happened 20, 30 years ago, when these were real problems. This, is in, this by the way, is in a country in which um, there are no restrictions whatsoever about carrying guns, except on an airplane, which I don't understand why there's not a restriction that I cannot carry a Glock or an AK-47 onto a, uh, a, a flight and just uh, have it there on my lap. I, I can't imagine why that that's such a bad idea. Um, that being said, um, I have been, I have not been, as a travel writer, uh, for two years I couldn't travel. I started back traveling on the, one time I traveled abroad, which was to Ireland um, in a coach class. It was horrendous. It was 100% packed. Um, there were lines. Um, getting in and out was very, very difficult. You have to wear a mask. You don't have to wear a mask. You have to wear, although it's very relaxed now, you had to have proof within 24 hours that you had been, um, you did not have COVID. It just adds to the, all of the anxieties, okay? So my second flight was to Washington. 35-minute flight from LaGuardia to Washington. A little delayed at LaGuardia, as usual, half an hour, 45 minutes or so. So a 35-minute flight turned into a flight of an hour and a half or so. Okay, coming back, uh, went to the airport, busy time, but got right through security, and the flights delayed, of course. Flights delayed. Okay, again. No, we're getting you on the plane. We're getting you out of here for that 35-minute flight. This is an hour and a half later. Get us on the plane. Taxi out to the tarmac. Shut down the engines. Oh, no, this is not good. 
not because of mechanical problems, but because we have no idea, no idea when any planes are going into the eastern cities because of um, rain and uh, the thunderstorms and so forth. So we're going back, giving you an update. Well, that was three and a half hours in. I turned to my wife and said, we are never taking off. <clears throat> so we hopped on an Amtrak, which cost us another 200 bucks each. But it arrived at exactly three hours and 27 minutes, just as it said it would. Um, while we were on the train, we get an announcement from American Airlines on my phone. Your flight was canceled. We're going to try and rebook you for a month from Tuesday. You know, and I'm thinking of all of these people who did not get out of the airport, <clears throat> who did not have access to hotels or could not, did not have the sense to get on Amtrak, sleeping over with thousands of others in Cincinnati and Atlanta and Miami and all the play, all those airports that were not uh, leaving, the planes leaving. And I said, this is what it has become. This is what it has become. This is what I can expect. And the thought of going on an airplane again for me is like entering one of the circles of Dante's hell. Uh, <laughs> that if I possibly can, I would fly business class. First class is almost non-existent at this point, at this point, unless you go on <coughs> Saudi Arabian airliner, <coughs> excuse me, Singapore or something. And, <coughs> excuse me. Business class is an alternative, but it has gotten so expensive <clears throat> for me to have gone to Ireland, which I could have done with frequent flyer mileage, maybe cost me 1,200 points or something. Uh, now it is costing uh, $6,000 to go to Ireland. Mm. <clears throat> so that's prohibitive. And uh, I don't know what I'm going to do because I'm not getting on, on any 19 hour flights to New Zealand that is going to be delayed by a day or two crossing international run on in coach. Uh, <clears throat> I'm just too old for that. And uh, so it's a real dilemma. So if I may wax nostalgic, one of the great things about this show is that your viewers know about a time when if you went to the airport and you were late for your 2 p.m. flight on TWA. Oh, there's another Eastern Airlines leaving at 2.45. Here, just take your ticket, <clears throat> go over to Eastern and get on the flight. Well, don't you have to... No, 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 there are plenty of seats. I, I just checked the plenty of seats. Just go on. That was the way it was. Back in those days, um, not that the food was any better, but there was more room when they came out with the 707s and then the 747s. It was a long time, decades, in which if I was flying from JFK or Idlewild, to Los Angeles or San Francisco, the West Coast, that there was a good chance there were going to be two, three, even a whole row of seats on a 747, which I could get and lie down on as if I was in. Yeah. First. Oh, yeah. Okay? Yeah. It hasn't happened in years because of cutbacks and so forth. And they used to need these planes out there. They said, well, you know, if it's only half full, just cancel the flight, which they will do today. Back then, that flight had to be in Los Angeles because it was taking off three hours later to go back to New York or to go on to Hawaii or something. So those flights had to be in place, which is the good thing about international flights. <laughs> those flights do have to go to Dublin. Those flights do have to go to Paris because they are needed for that Paris flight to either go back to New York or to go to Atlanta or something. Um, so uh, uh, international flights take precedence uh, over others. Um, there is, of course, also the three and a half hour window uh, after which if you've been on the tarmac for three and a half hours, they have to cancel the flight because the uh, pilots and flight attendants would be too tired for a flight that might take six to seven hours. Not a bad idea, but, <laughs> you know, after three and a half hours, you get your, your plane canceled in the old days with the Eastern shuttle and the Delta Delta shuttle. People, except our age, will find it impossible to believe this. But if you got to uh, LaGuardia and you had a flight on the shuttle to either Boston or Washington and they were, the plane was full up, or even if you got there a little bit late, they would roll out a new plane for you. <laughs> Knowing that 10, 20 other people were going to be showing up in the next 15 minutes before they got the plane there. Or you could just wait another half an hour 
because there was another there was, they, they went every half hour <clears throat> on the hour for delta on the half hour for eastern i mean it was bliss okay uh, now john yeah. you know you know there's a whole swath of people watching this who think you're making this all up john am i making this all up no oh, no you're not as a matter of fact i would say that for about a five-year period of time uh i flew maybe 48 to 50 weeks a year throughout the United States and Canada. And not only did you have wow. Pan Am and Easton with shuttles to and from Boston and Washington out of New York, but if you were uh, on time, you were going to get, unless it was really weather was socked something in some place, you, they were going to get you on a plane. If they had to break their necks, they would get you on a plane. And the yeah. interesting thing, the interesting thing I think between then and now is right. that they have right. overscheduled air uh, flights that they know that they can't possibly fulfill. And it used to be, in addition to, let's say, needing to get a plane someplace so that it could get back, let's say, from overseas particularly, but even going Boston to LA and back, they had to have, to, had to have an airplane. They also had scheduled uh, uh, moving mail and freight, and that's actually what paid the bills. And then the passengers were just sort of like gravy. Yeah. Um, and now they don't just seem to, the, they canceled so many flights, why book them in the first place? Yes, people like won't be able to book, but at least they'll get there on the fewer flights that they have crew available for. I, uh, the point that you made up front, John, about the fact that they, in their wisdom, they excessed all the uh, older pilots by buying out their contracts and say, go retire early so they could save a couple of bucks has now come and bit us all in the butt because they just don't have enough crews. So I think right. that should at least, as terrible as it is, they should stop scheduling all these flights that they know they can't fulfill anyway because they don't have crew. So that would be oh, getting point. rid of some good of the point. frustration. People should be aware that if you got onto the flight because you're a little late, it right. usher you on. You paid for your ticket on the flight. Right. You didn't have yeah. to arrange it or anything. You could. Right. If you didn't have to do that. You know, it was absolutely remarkable. Um, imagine doing that uh, today. Uh, it was just, it was a service that fly the friendly skies of United meant just that. <clears throat> we are here to serve you. The flight attendants are beautiful. You get a crummy meal, but you also get your Coca-Cola or your beer. You didn't have to pay for it. And if there's a snafu, you don't have to pay a change fee of $150, which I hear the airlines have kind of gotten away with uh, post-COVID or, or during COVID. <clears throat> Who knows? Um, but it was really a hospitality industry. And as Art says, it was the mail and it was the cargo mm -hmm. and stuff, which really paid the bills. And we were just uh, gravy. But we were, we, you know, we were all, we got dressed up in jack and tie, and the stewardesses were pretty, and the, the captain would come out of the cabin and pin little plastic uh, um, uh, wings on the children. Uh, flying was wonderful. Talk about watching those politics. And I think it, it, maybe two two years ago, we, we happened to bring this up. After I moved to California, uh, I would fly between San Francisco, uh, well, I lived in Southern California, but the Orange County and San Francisco. And uh, you used to be able to walk up, there was no security gates at the time either. And you had an airplane that had a, like a smile on its nose. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you walk up the there, stairs, and if there was space, you just sat down and you paid yeah. on the plane. And everybody treated you well. Uh, the, as you said, the food has not changed a whole lot between then and now. But... Uh, you, have, you, you, could, you could depend on getting someplace more often than not. Yeah. The movie, I think it was called Three Weeks in Rome. And it was about the... Okay, so I think there's a, a unanimous uh, uh, agreement here that air, airplane travel today sucks. Fuck. Take the train. Right. Well, thank you, John. And I hope things uh, improve at least a little bit for you for international travel and that uh, you don't have to pay these outrageous uh, fares to get a comfortable seat. Uh, like you say, when the 747s came around, they gave everybody some extra room, and then they just started packing them in and, and narrowing the seats, putting more wide, put one more seat wide, uh, uh, taking six inches off the leg room. 
and uh, it's, it's just not a fun experience. You're right. But well, if you if you're young, if you're young and you're short, uh, go fly. <laughs> Thank you, John. Well, for the time being, as Oscar Wilde said, I'm just trying to live up to my new wallpaper. <laughs> For more on Celebrating Act Two, visit our webpage, follow us on Facebook, subscribe to us on YouTube, and tell your friends. Celebrating Act Two is the user manual for the second half of your life.